So, what we're going to shoot for, there's people that aren't here that said they were going to come for 9 o'clock, which is fine, that happens. It's going to probably take a couple Sundays. So, our ultimate goal would be is to help everyone, because of the way this is laid out, to find a place that you can basically call your own with flexibility. Does that make sense? So for now, you know, ideally there, there's different formations, different things of people, but this is how the room's going to work. We have two sections upstairs, we have three sections in the back, and then this. Interesting enough, with, with COVID, the most difficulties are actually with the ones and the twos, because you sit one chair or a pair of chair, uh, two chairs, and then you have to go six feet all the way around them, that, that eats up space fast. So just understand we're going to do the best we can. Like there are certain groupings we can put together because of people being in each other's homes or those kinds of things. So we're doing our best to work forward. The other aspect of this, the mass side of it, um, you all did great coming in. So just a reminder, you all did wonderful in the parking. Thank you so much. Just remember to come through this front door so we can do the check-in. Just to remind you, the purpose of the check-in is just simply we have to ask, have you, or have you asked yourself in your home the five questions? Because technically speaking, if you, have, if you answer yes to any of the five, you're not supposed to come in. And the reason for that, and here, and this, and I explained this a few weeks ago, but I want to just remind you of it. This is so for all of you that go to work tomorrow, and then you're asked those same five questions tomorrow at work, you can answer, to my knowledge, I'm good because we did our due diligence here, asking everyone that came here to do the same, so that supposed to be that everyone that came in, as far as they know, they're good. So then you on Monday can say, as far as I know, I'm good. And then the second purpose is the checklist is just so that if something happened, and so let's just say, for example, Nate goes to work and on Tuesday, and in long story short, he ends up, you know, he is sick, we then, when they contact him and say, okay, who, who have you been around for the last 24, 48 hours, we have a list of contacts. We know who was here and who wasn't, um, both on the sense side of safety if you were here, but then, quite frankly, for your benefit, if you weren't here, you don't have to worry about quarantine, <laughs> unlike the rest of us. Thanks, Nate, for making us do that. Anyway. No, that was just figured. All right. So now we go back to a little bit more of a, uh, we've been having fun for the last four months outside. Here we are back inside. Take a quick look at your bulletins, just some things to make sure you're aware of. I haven't done this in a long time. I feel rusty. All right. Uh, today at five o'clock, uh, if you're interested, there is a bonfire hymn sing at the Aubrey's. Just uh, bring a snack, a chair, as opposed to a char. Man, back to the, back to the bulletin bloopers. Um, I told Jiko yesterday as I'm folding, I'm like, this is one thing I did not miss. Let me just tell you. Um, bring warm clothes and blankets, and then cider and cocoa are going to be provided. So that's tonight at the obvious at 5 o'clock. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, Debbie Sears, her lady Bible study group, will be meeting here at the church. That's at 3 o'clock. And then um, Amy's study is next Tuesday at 6.30 at her house. And then uh, Jika's group is next Thursday at Stacy's house. At 6:45, if you want to be part of a, a ladies' Bible study and you're not right now, let us know, and we'll make sure you get hooked up with one of those. Uh, Wednesday is supposed to be prayer and fellowship, and then uh, next Sunday uh, we continue with our double services. Uh, there's some other announcements and things. Copies of the 2020 budget is there. It sounds funny that we're going to be voting on that in October instead. We should have done that back in April. Such is life. Um, and then, uh, let's see, the, the church camp, if you're planning on or hoping to go, it, we've already paid for it all. So if you can just slowly start paying us, that would be great. And just make it out to the church. And, uh, and then we'll make sure that uh, campsites will deal with all that in the summer. But if you are hoping to go, that would be very helpful. All right, that's that. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, once again, in terms of the Sermon on the Mount, in terms of thought, um, once again goes on a minor shift, okay? Um, but it's still all one cohesive message. Um, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. Quite frankly, you all think I'm long-winded. 
<clears throat> Matthew 5, 6, 7 is one sermon. I'm just saying, you know, cut me some slack. I do not take you through all of that in one setting. But anyways, here we go. The first 14 verses of the chapter have a certain link, meaning it looks like it's a build-up to basically ch uh, chapter 7, verse... Uh, let's see, I always get this wrong. Um, bifocals are in my future. Verse 12, which we call the golden rule, which I'll be getting to in a couple weeks. But it looks like uh, the first 12, 14 verses are sort of like a gear up towards that. Uh, a couple of examples of what not to do and one example of what to do. So that we'll be heading in that direction. So I thought we would read the first 14 verses this morning. Chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce your will you will be judged, I'm sorry, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye, do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. Those who find it are few. Please join me as we pray. Father God, we are grateful. We have to be. We have to be grateful, Lord. There are so many places in this world that deny even the freedom or the ability to worship. There are so many places in this world that will actually inflict violence and torture on those who would dare gather in the name of Christ. Father, I do pray for all of us, the wisdom, as the scripture says, to understand the times, to know when to speak, when even to protest, and when not to when to abide and comply, and when not to. Lord, I just, I thank you that we have a building. I thank you we have property. I thank you that you have blessed this church for so very long. And so, Lord, as we gather under these conditions, I just pray, help us to not overly focus on what we don't have and stay reminded of what we do have. I thank you for each family that's here this morning. And I pray likewise for the second service, which is unique for our culture. I pray for just all those this morning that are here, that you would be with them and the, the different decisions and challenges that they are facing. I pray for Jesse and Jessica and the, the journey they have with their home and how they're going to proceed and then just the means to, uh, to accomplish those goals and to get there. Father, I pray continue grace upon Rochelle and her recovery. I thank you that she's doing well and can even be a part of our time of worship this morning. I thank you for our students. I thank you for um, our teachers. I thank you for our medical staff. I thank you for those who just seek to serve the, the, the kingdom through the community. I thank you, Father, for all of those who uh, just each and every day strive to be faithful to you in front of whoever they're, they're walking and living amongst. Father, I pray for all in regards to jobs and uh, just
just the uncertain future of how things are working out with COVID, uh, the concerns of elections, and then also just the potential uh, as the flu season gets stronger, will other greater restrictions come? Lord, we don't know. And it's that uncertainty that causes just uh, disruption and, and anxiety. And I pray, Lord, as we talked about last week, help us. Help us to trust you. Help us to be loyal to you. Lord God, you are the faithful, creating, providing, saving God. So, Lord, I just pray, help us to you know, commit our way to you, and that we will continue to strive and learn how to be a church family to others, to those around us here. And just help us to be patient with one another, kind, gracious. And Lord, as we continue to work through needs and challenges, that we would look to you, be there for one another. Continue to be with Jill, Dottie, Winnie, all of those that are remembering loved ones and family that are gone. I pray for them in their mourning and in their grief. And Lord, I pray especially for Jill and Janice, just understanding that while they're grieving, there's also the, the legal aspect to this that's just going to go on for a while. And while they've been great with them, it's just going to be long and hard. So, Father, use this service time to encourage our hearts or to remind us of your truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Nate, let's do something we haven't done in a while. Let's uh, sing congregationally where we can actually hear each other. As you get up, yeah. yeah. I could say, or just don't sing, but I don't want to actually encourage that. So, you know. <laughs> So it's a singing with muffled nature. They give me permission to. Because he spits at the slide. I got this thing. <laughs> it is, again. Sorry, look, I got some of mine on there. <laughs> <laughs> Reflecting back to last week, oh boy, the wind was like extra strong. It was like. Now, and again, the blessing of coming in, it, again, we've got to. There's downers, but there's some good positive things too. And I'm. Glad to be able to see you closer and also get to hear you uh, join us in music as we worship. And uh, again, thinking about uh, what to sing today. The first thing that popped in my mind was the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And uh, one passage of scripture that was pretty special to my dad at various points in his ministry uh, was in Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. And you know, again, going through the Old Testament, watching the nation of Israel go up and down, up and down, turn their backs on God, and God would uh, bring some judgment and stuff like that to get them to turn back to him. And again, his ongoing faithfulness, his love that continued to flow to them. And again, we've been grafted in as people who love Christ and were a part of that uh, body of the worship in heaven with him. But Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declared the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And one other verse that thinking in terms of our salvation in Christ, Philippians 1, 6. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. As we sing, great is thy faithfulness, you know, that third verse, pardon for sin and the peace that endureth, thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. And then in the chorus, great is thy faithless, great is thy faith. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Join as we stand and sing, great is thy faithless. Thank you. 
Every heart of the 
All right, the scientist is saying you can clear off the mask down to here for your singing so that you don't die. So that's good. I like that. Well, Ryan, if you want to bring this down, my this mic, it's the number, whatever. Yeah, just bring it down just a little bit. Okay. Back to the indoor part of it. Yeah, you just throw it in there. Okay, so good news. You're all on camera. Actually, no, you're not. Just up here is on camera. But you've all been recorded. That's really great. This is for uh, some that still aren't able to come. I would I would encourage you to pray for uh, people like Winnie. Winnie's um, immunity system is severely compromised on multiple levels. And just so we're understanding that, that it would actually not be a great thing for her to come for now. Uh, and so that's hard for her and because she really would want to be here. And so, and there's always others and then at times when we're sick. So we will be posting the service on uh, the YouTube and Facebook, um, possibly a link through our webpage. So um, we're working on that part of it. We're having to re-gear up on some of those things since we've been meeting outside for so long. So that will just take a, probably a couple of weeks to get smooth. All right, Matthew 7. Um, working our way through the Sermon on the Mount here, having a good time with that. Um, as I mentioned before, just it is very important I think for us to realize that the Sermon on the Mount is a unit of intentional singular thought. And even though Jesus offers a very wide range in a short space, different principles and elements of truth and applications, it's still important to understand that they all, they all build upon each other. So I, I know I've been saying this a lot, but I just want to remind you, all of the sermon builds on the first 20 verses of chapter 5. Everything else from verse 21 of chapter 5 to the end of chapter 7 all find its support from the first 20 verses of what does it mean to be repentant and entering the kingdom of God, Matthew 4, 17. And then, okay, that repentant life through the Spirit leads to a growing, developing beatitude life. And then the question is, well, okay, what does that look like? And that's where he starts in verse 21 all the way to the end of chapter 7, and gives us different places, different parts of our everyday living, and says, okay, here's what the Beatitude life's going to look like. And a lot of it, I'm telling you, a lot of it's radical. A lot of it, without the Spirit, it doesn't work, because I'm not capable of it. And it's okay for us to realize that, that we need the Spirit's help to live out the life God calls us to. When he says at the end of chapter 5, be perfect for your heavenly father is perfect, it is not a declaration of, okay, you repent and now you're uh, one of God's, you will live in perfection. Religion has been built on that bad teaching. And people get so frustrated, disillusioned, because they aren't perfect, and quite frankly, are either are their church leaders, and before you know it, people want to give up on the church. And it's because of bad teaching like that to say, well, it says it right here. That's why we teach the Bible here at Adamsville, because there are things that we need to make sure we understand contextually. What was Jesus telling his first listeners? He was trying to help them understand that the standard of living is to be sought after by comparison to the Father, not each other. And that's where today goes. So the Sermon on the Mount, intentional thought, showing what any one life can become as they repent, as they understanding that repentance is a turning towards God and away from self-centeredness, and start living by faith in Jesus. Ultimately, it's this idea that the character of God, the holiness and purity of God, slowly becomes the character of any of us who believe by faith. That's amazing. And it's a God work. It's not something we will ourselves towards it's not something that okay i believe in jesus now i will become this holy pure person oh no it's god that keeps growing in us and part of that is the growing affection for god as first john 5 4 says this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith 
our faith connects us to everything else that's promised in the scriptures and helps us then live it. Through the Spirit's working, we take on the principles of the Beatitude life where they become part of our character, impacting how we engage and respond to our daily living. As Jesus gets closer to the end of this sermon and presents what we often call the golden rule, Matthew 7, 12, he then offers three warnings, two in the negative, one in the positive, to guide us in how we can live out that rule. So here we are at the doorstep of the first warning, and it's very simple. Don't be a judgmental person. So let's pray and then dig into this. Father God, I do pray for your wisdom and grace as we search your scriptures and quite frankly, as we hear a tough saying. Lord, help us to understand that the Beatitude life more than anything else calls us to give up selfishness and self-centeredness and self-exalting. And this particular teaching today really keys in on that. So help us have the ears to hear and the willingness to wrestle. We pray this in your name. Amen. Matthew 7, 1 to 2. Here's the warning. It's a warning against having a condemning attitude. All right? That's this, these first two verses in a nutshell. D.A. Carson says, we human beings display a vast capacity for self-deception. If we take the challenge Jesus gives to strive for his holiness and righteousness at the end of chapter 5, to seek the Father's character of holy perfection, that requires a great deal of surrender, self-sacrifice, and faithful humility, all accomplished only through the leading and empowering of the Holy Spirit. But here's the truth of it. We can easily deceive ourselves into thinking we are pursuing holy living, God-glorifying living, when in fact we cross the bridge to self-glorifying living. It's not hard to start off rightly and doing something rightly and doing something for all the right reasons. And then at some point, as we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, where our motives lead us to then say, hey, look at me. It's a little bit of Peter on the water. When Peter first steps out in the water and he's focused on Jesus. He's walking. <laughs> the second Peter looks at himself and goes, look what I'm doing. He starts sinking. And it's a little bit like that. The second we take our focus off of Christ and start going, hey, look at my righteousness. Look at what I did. Look at my spiritual resume. We start sinking. We cross the bridge from a right living, from a God-glorifying living, to a self-centered, self-glorifying living. Now, don't get me wrong. You could just as easily then cross back through repentance and a realization, oh, wow, I, 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 I'm, I'm a little off here. I need to come back. And sometimes it happens like that. I literally crossed it once and I came right back. And at other times, I cross it, and this is what D.A. Carson's getting at, and we deceive ourselves into thinking we're still on God's side of the bridge. And by the way, let me be clear right away. I'm not talking about our actual salvation. I'm simply talking about an intentional mindset of living life for him. Man, I'm having to get used to actually being able to see the whites of your eyes now. It, this distance thing, and now it's like, wow, you're right there. I mean, this is like, okay, whew, all right. <laughs> Got to get back into my uh, rhythm here. All right. So with that being said, because we can easily deceive ourselves, we need to make sure that we understand, once again, another aspect of Jesus' teaching. So before I move forward on what this means about being judgmental, let's be clear what it doesn't mean. First of all, it doesn't mean we should never make spirit-led discernments about people who are in sin where their life fruit is black and terrible. This isn't talking about a clarity of engagement, no, of having a clear relationship with people, and by having that relationship with people, through time, through relationship, we can clearly see the fruit of their lives, the aim of their life is not for God. Regardless of any claims they might make, there is nothing wrong with making that discernment. It is a humble, spirit-led discernment. We are to pray for godly, spirit-informed judgments 
that ask for wisdom to see rightly any who we engage with. 1 John 4, 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There are those on the radio, internet, TV, all of it, that you shouldn't listen to or give your time to. Now, how do we discern that? Very humbly, seeking the truth of the word and the leading of the spirit. And it most certainly shouldn't be done in arrogance. I will on occasion denounce a certain teacher or whatever, but you'll never hear me demonize them. And I most certainly will not uh, call their salvation into question because that's between them and God. But I will oftentimes, yes, I will tell you people that I feel put you at risk because that's part of my role That's as a shepherd protecting sheep. That's what I'm supposed to do. But how I do it is very important. And that's what we're talking about here. And uh, interesting, Jesus tells his disciples, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. John chapter 7, verse 24. So this isn't about removing all kinds of discerning decisions or um, in, engagements with people. This passage is not saying you can't have an opinion or you can't discern about anybody. That's not what it's saying. Okay, so then let's talk about what it is it saying. What does it mean to judge? Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, as a society, we have so abused this phrase. I feel so judged. Oh, they're judging me. Oh, you know, ah. <laughs> we don't even understand what we're saying. So let's make sure we're talking the same lingo as I go forward in this message. Based on the context, the usage of to judge, the verb here, seems to be focusing on do not be judgmental. Okay, that's using the same word. No, let's not do that. Do not adopt a critical spirit, a condemning attitude. See, this is more than just about snap judgments. This is more, although those aren't always helpful, this is more about than just about having a mere opinion, although that, I will tell you, is the beginning point of a condemning attitude. But this is about long-term. This is about well-developed. This is about having an attitude and a spirit of something that condemns and criticizes everybody and everything. Jesus says, don't be that person. If you go over to Romans 14, 10 later on some other time, uh, it's a similar. Uh, when you read in, John, in Romans 14, it's the exact same uh, Greek usage, okay? If you want another passage that will help you get this. The righteous pursuit is spirit-led. It is scriptural-led. It is humility-led discernment as opposed to that the self-centered pursuit is a critical, condemning judgment. So let me see if I can help flesh this out. Judgment can be viewed as simply this, although unfortunately it's actually not overly simple. Any thought, any thought from our own thinking about another that we uh, consider high and exalted, which is another no-no, Romans 12.3, where we consider it high and exalted enough to then make a determination about that person. Now, here's where it gets more clear. To the point where it impacts how we think of them, speak of them, speak of, I'm sorry, speak to them, speak about them, and all around treat them according to our self-righteous conclusion. That is a judgment. There's so many phases to that. The first phase is having an opinion. And then that opinion becomes a determination. And that determination then leads to a hard-drawn conclusion that I then act upon. And it's those last two that create judgment. Think of it in a court system. The judge listens to the opinions. He then makes a determination and then pronounces the conclusive judgment. So if somebody says they're judging me, what they usually mean is 
they're they're expressing a critical opinion. They're saying something about me that goes against what I think of me. But that's not judgment unless that spoken word is affecting how I that I if I'm the one that's speaking that word, if it affects the way I treat you, talk to you, talk about you, that's where judgment comes in. And the reason I think it's important to make a differential is because sometimes we all will just make snap judgments. But that doesn't mean that's necessarily what I think of you. And once again, even that we get very offended by, and, and that's not always wrong, but understanding snap judgments are oftentimes simply careless moments. I think spouses, for example, run into that all the time. In the heat of the moment, in the frustration, maybe I'm uh, just this whole week, the fact that my children are still alive and my wife still loves me is amazing because getting ready for two services and everything, yeah, the bear can easily come out. You know, I just get stressed and I get worried. And, uh, you know, thank God for Jesus because he does help get through these things. But a snap judgment where a spouse says something real quick because they're stressed or frustrated, okay, that doesn't mean that's what they think of you. That is different than what Jesus is talking about. And once again, I'm not justifying the snap judgment. I'm just saying there's a difference. And what's being talked about here is the condemning attitude. That is what Jesus is calling judgment. Jesus urges those seeking God's kingdom through repentance, those learning to live the beatitude life, don't be someone who judges others. Don't be that self-righteous person. If there is a need for discernment or opportunity to help win a fellow believer back to faithful living, we actually have biblical instruction on how to do that. Matthew 18, 15 and following Galatians 6, 1. We have biblical instruction on how to make a right judgment, a right discerning judgment regarding someone's journey because part of that judgment would be a desire to help them come back and work through it all, not to condemn them. Now, a primary element in those pursuits, in right pursuits, is always, always a humble attitude toward the one being challenged to stop, to confess, to repent. It's not about me winning or being above them. It's trying to help them. Otherwise, any attitude that looks to base the discussion, here we go, here is the key sinful element. Any time an attitude looks to base the discussion on the comparative. Remember what I said, Jesus is saying in the end of chapter 5, if you're going to do a comparative, fine, do it with you and God. Because you'll always be on the bottom end of that one. You'll always have to be challenged in your poverty of spirit and in your meekness and in your need for his hungering, for his righteousness. Because the second I make the comparative one of you, I can quickly get to the condemning attitude. And a lot of times people use the condemning attitude to make themselves feel better about places that they feel bad in. Or weaken. So any attitude that looks to base the discussion on the comparative, generally speaking, is full of self-glory and sinful pursuits, easily, easily deceiving themselves into thinking they are doing God's work, pursuing righteousness. Jesus adds to this principal warning, don't be one who judges others. Otherwise, he says, you will be judged as well by God facing the same comparative judgment in your relationships with others. Verse 2. Friends, the weight of this warning is often missed, so let me make it as plain as I can. Jesus is telling his listeners, if you exhibit a character of judgmental criticism towards others, you are revealing that you are not poor in spirit, meek, merciful, hungering for righteousness, Mournful over sin, pure in heart, or a peacemaker. In other words, as D.A. Carson asked the question, do we really want the standard of God's justice to be applied to ourselves in the way we are prone to apply it to others? 
if we are a self-inflated critical judge of others. That's what Jesus is trying to warn them of. If we develop a critical condemning attitude towards others, it reveals we are not broken or repentant. Because that's the only way to live in a critical condemning mindset. You cannot look to God and see the glory and the beauty and the holiness of God and then condemn others. There's no way. Because the second I look to God, I realize who I am and why I need Him. And it's then easier for me to recognize we're all in the same boat. Let me put it another way that maybe will hit your buttons a little bit better. If you are determined that you know who a person is, if you are determined you know their thoughts and attitudes, if you are determined that they are not worthy of you, if you are determined you know how poor of a parent, a spouse, a neighbor, a laborer they are, if you are determined to place a judgment upon someone that affects the mercy and kindness and love God has given you to the point where you will not give it to them, all because you are determined that you know what is true about them, if that describes you, without hopefully sounding however this may sound, I pity you. Because that kind of determination takes an arrogance and takes a hardness that is beyond anything other than the grace of God. I warn you, as one who cares about you, be very careful when you say in your head, I know what they're thinking. I know that they talk about me. I know that they think this about me. The second you start determining that you know something, you are no longer walking in humility. You're walking in self-glorifying, self-centered thinking. And Jesus says, don't do that. As a whole, the Sermon on the Mount makes it clear, we do not earn mercy when we give mercy. Instead, we give mercy because we have received it from God. If we live in an ongoing attitude of haughtiness and arrogance and constantly comparing ourselves to others, determining we are better, they are lesser, then we are not poor in spirit or repentant. Now, once again, as I said earlier, I'm not talking about simple mistakes, singular bad moments, snap judgments. This principle is drawing out an ongoing attitude. And by the way, it could be an ongoing attitude towards an individual or a small group, meaning it's not that you have that attitude towards everyone necessarily. So it's a warning. This is an important warning to any of us. Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 to 5 then says, instead of judging... Discern wisely your own heart and shortcomings before you engage others about theirs. So it goes from a warning to a basic principle of how to live in the beatitude life with a community. Jesus, still in the framework of judging, okay, that, that, that's where this comes from, challenges the listener, how is it you can pass judgment on someone's speck, someone's white sock, and completely miss your own law. That's what he's saying. Once again, in an overly self-inflated view of something we have determined is true, we completely somehow ignore our own shortcoming or sin. How does that even make sense? And the answer is, when you're sitting back, not being emotional, it's like, well, yeah, that's obvious. But when our ire gets up, when our critical nature gets up, when we feel bad about ourselves, we then oftentimes are tempted to go on the attack against others. This is where the self-deception can come in because, friends, we need Jesus all the time. And it's because it's so easy to get uptight with people. 
we all can quickly get to that place of criticism and judgment towards another. Jesus is saying one way to slow that down is make sure that you recognize that you have logs. Now, once again, I love the phrasing of this. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then. See, it doesn't say we have to be perfect to engage each other on growth. That's a good thing. Otherwise, I would never have had the right to teach my kids. I would most certainly never have the right to stand up here. Because I am full of imperfections. I have plenty of logs. And over time, as we grow in grace, God helps us get the logs out of the way. But that's a journey. That's a process. It doesn't say that you have to be completely perfect. It says, deal with your logs. And then, as you're doing so, you can help others with their specs. And because, and the reason is, is because then you're actually in the spirit of helping rather than the spirit of winning. Or in the spirit of being right. Or in the spirit of being self-righteous. Because if I'm consistently working on my logs, part of what that means is I'm keeping my eyes where they belong. The comparative is with God. And then if God then lets me see a, a speck in one of your lives... It's because I'm keeping an eye on him, and I see what I need to be, and I can see that you're struggling, and I can come alongside you and say, hey, let me help. Instead of me looking at you, feeling bad about myself in one area, so I try to look for one of you that I can then pick on and basically push you down so I can feel better about myself. That's what feeds the condemning attitude. I won't go as far as to say it's always malicious. But it certainly takes us close. We don't like how people vote, so we malign them. We critically judge them. We don't like how people talk. We don't like how people, like certain team. I mean, our nation is out of control. And here's Jesus' whole point. The church should be different. Sure, some of you can talk too much. Some of you don't talk enough. Some of you are very socially awkward. Some of you are socially obnoxious. Some of you are rather loud. <clears throat> and some of you are too mousy. Some of you are... I think you get the point, right? Here's my point. No one can survive a microscope examination about their character and personality. If you want to find something wrong with them, you can and will find it. But I like playing fair, so here's fair. Just so we're all clear, that works both ways. Jesus wants us to stop having overly developed criticisms towards one another that are often white socks issues while completely missing more substantial issues we are having in our own lives. Marriages. Jeke and I cannot, at least in this one area, I can say with pretty confident levels, we've tried to show you what a wrestling, growing marriage should look like. And that includes uh, twice in our marriage counseling. That includes various moments of struggling and all of that. And at the same time, I can tell you I wouldn't trade any of it after 26 years. What's my point? My point is, is there are substantial issues in your marriage. Are you letting God take you to the gospel and work through it? Or is it easier to look at other people and go, well, we're not as bad as them. Or, well, you know, I, I have this reason that we're this way. It's not really my fault. Like, we are so quick to find the specs in other people. And sometimes it's for avoidance. Sometimes it's because we just feel crappy and we don't like that. Friends, all relationship issues, all personality issues take labor. You can either labor with the Spirit of God and the truth of the gospel, or you can labor on your own. But we're all laboring. God wants us to labor in a helpful, productive way. We should far more lovingly handle White Sox issues and discern them far better than the world does, friends. The church should be better at it. We can help one another best grow in the beatitude life and in grace when we meekly discern our own weaknesses and be open to others talking to us about where we might fall short. All of this is discerning 
all of this type of mental, spiritual discerning helps us slow down and not rush in to correct others. It helps us temper our words and our emotions as we seek to genuinely help someone rather than come at them with expressed judgment and unkindness. Take some time to speak in your devotions and read in this order, John 13, 34, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7, and then 1 Peter 4, 7 to 11. This develops a biblical path of how to express a God-shaped love to others. It is a path that does not include a self-inflated, self-glorifying, critical attitude toward another. All right, it's time I start landing this plane. These five verses teach the church one of the most important applications of the gospel in our relating to one another. Because of the love God has lavished upon me by loving me while I was still his enemy, by forgiving me and giving me a relationship with him, I am now free to offer his love to others, learning to love people as a whole and to stop trying to selfishly love people in slices. Jesus' love includes a patient walking with us even while we are weak and stubborn with selfishness and pride. Our love for one another needs to be tempered with an understanding that while any person has weaknesses and shortcomings that may frustrate and affect others, so do I. It's not that we just put up with weaknesses and shortcomings. It's that we humbly realize we are all contributing. We are all contributing to relational brokenness. Therefore, we have a responsibility to seek forgiveness from others, to work at our weaknesses and shortcomings, to be patient with others in the midst of their expressions of weakness. And above all, a motivation to help one another reconcile when selfish weakness has been expressed, and oftentimes by both parties. Not always. When people develop an opinion of me, or any of us, okay, in most cases, it's with incomplete information. That's, that's the thing that makes me smile and snicker when people uh, express opinions about others. Nine times out of ten, most opinions people have of another person are, are at best 60-70% full. Nobody, nobody in this room has the ability to read or know anyone 100% up here. That's impossible. Only God knows the heart. Only God knows someone completely. I don't care if you have the personality that actually is gifted to see and whatever like that. I'm telling you, nobody has a complete picture of anybody. That right there should give us pause. That should help slow us down. But here's the thing. Those incomplete opinions often are developed through a filter which includes their own insecurities, their own pain, and their own brokenness. So therefore, their opinion will often be overinflated, either in the positive or in the negative. The problem gets worse, however, when they often then express that opinion, and if that opinion develops into a conclusion which they base on how they treat me, it becomes judgment. Here's the thing. Jesus says to all of his followers, why? Why give the emotional energy to have such a judgment? What motivates others to not only have a judgment, but here's where it even goes worse, to then start to get others to share it. For Christians... What purpose does that serve? Let me give you a very quick example to end with. Terry. Terry is a fictional person, just so you know. Terry is harsh, loud, and even possibly mildly violent. You've been around him when he speaks, when he expresses his temper, when he has almost hurt someone. And in those moments, we have a choice. Do we develop a judgment about him that affects our attitude and response to him? Or 
Do we see him as Jesus does and try to humbly help him see his sins and shortcomings in such a way that he turns to the gospel for help and healing? Pastor, isn't that being a little idealistic? Yes, it is. And by the way, helping someone doesn't mean you ignore certain things. It doesn't mean you don't have boundaries. It doesn't mean that you aren't saved. My point is, is what's, what's going on in here? I can protect myself from someone who is uh, relationally, behaviorally out of control. I can protect myself and still try to help them and not hate them here. To not judge them here. Now, once again, is that an act of can? No. <laughs> that would be an act of the Spirit in can. Helping me work through that. I am simply here to warn all of us. When we give permission to an attitude of critical condemning judgment towards anyone, we are calling down upon us the same means of judgment from God. So I am trying to help all of us understand that developing and acting upon judgments will get us nowhere helpful with anyone. If we are going to be God's representatives before the lost world, then we have to see and approach people not with rose-colored glasses, but rather with honest glasses that see, first of all, our own sins and shortcomings, and those of others where our attitude is tempered by our understanding that we are just as guilty as anyone else to relational brokenness. And when we go to help, it's not to win. It's not to be proven right. It's not to beat someone down, even if they deserve it. But instead to help them meet Jesus and find real love, real help, and real purpose. Our role as disciples of Jesus is to show people what real hope looks like within our relationship. A hope of honest, open, safe, discerning, loving community within our homes, in our church. Friends, we just can't do that if we are too busy expressing critical, condemning judgments on those who do not match up to our selfish view of how things should be. Jesus is calling us to be different in the world by being more like him and seeing people with eternal eyes. For me personally, I believe these five verses are some of the most important verses the modern church in this country need to study, meditate upon, and take to heart. Because the temptation to be like the world is huge in this area of, of critical condemning speech and it's only worse right now because you can actually do it in three seconds with your thumbs and I would urge all of us to take heed to the warning Jesus offers here I would just say it this way we all have far more opinions about things that actually eternally speaking don't matter a lick and the question really comes down why do we spend so much energy on it Father, I pray, help us with this teaching. Help us to take it to heart and to let your Spirit show us either the people or the places we might be tempted to be condemning with our hearts and minds and words. Lord, help us to not be a people that waste gobs of energy on, a, on empty opinions or critical judgments, but rather to let your spirit continue to open our hearts and minds to our own sins and shortcomings, to let you grow in us in such a way that we are actually more able to humbly help others for the sake of your kingdom. And so it is this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so this is where one of the biggest places it's going to be different, and a lot of us are not going to like this. And I have to say, those of you that come at 9 are getting the short end of this straw. You have about 10, 15 minutes to visit. And what we need you to also do is actually slowly keep working your way to, at the very least, this room to visit so that we can prepare this area for people to start coming in. So I, it doesn't mean you can't visit at all. I'm just saying over the next, I'd say, about 10 minutes, slowly start working your way to these doors and go heading out this way. You'll have to get your mask back on. 
unless you want to talk to each other across the room, but that kind of gets hard. And unfortunately, that's the way it's going to have to be for a little while, at least. I am truly hoping and praying, as Nate and I were talking, a short season of life for our church at this time. So I am really glad you were able to come out this morning. I hope it blesses and encourages you. And friends, just to understand, tomorrow and Monday, not only is the Spirit of God ready and willing to walk with you, but so is the temptation, the self-centeredness, and flesh. Start your day and go through your week grabbing a hold of God and asking Jesus to walk with you. Because that is what gets us through. Because these days are not easy. Love all of you. Truly a blessing to have you here this morning. Have a great week.